This is America on the Road, named Best Radio Show by the International Automotive Media Conference, and now in its 27th year on the air. Thanks for being with us as we bring you the latest automotive information from around the world. Car makers are asking Congress to lift the cap on the tax credit for electric vehicle purchases. We'll have the details and our reactions to that coming up. And BMW has announced the test of a new battery that could offer EVs 750 miles of range on a charge. We'll give you the details on this potential breakthrough coming up. America on the Road is brought to you by Mercury Insurance and DrivingToday.com. If you're looking to save some money, you should switch to Mercury for your auto and home insurance. Californians save an average of $670 with Mercury. So imagine how much you could save. Get a quote today at DrivingToday.com slash auto insurance. That's DrivingToday.com slash auto hyphen insurance. But don't write hyphen. Put a hyphen in there. Hi, I'm Jack D. Red. With me is co-host Chris Teague. Chris lives at one end of the country. I live at the other. Each week we get together to talk about cars and the car industry. I'll tell you, Chris, I just attended the Motor Press Guild's Drive Day. I guess I'm, I'm president of the Motor Press Guild, to tell you the truth, too. So I'm, I'm plugging my own event, but uh, we enjoyed it. I'm wondering if you attend something similar uh, in the Northeast. I have, although I'm not the president of the New England Motor Press Association, but we do have uh, a couple of drive days. We have one in summer and one in winter. Uh, the summer one is coming right up next month. It's a nice drive from uh, Massachusetts to Maine uh, in a bunch of uh, convertibles, so I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, that sounds like a blast. Uh, maybe I can join in as, as an associate member or something like that, get in on that. <laughs> that would be fun. Uh, what vehicle will you be describing in your road test this week? I spent the week in the 2022 Hyundai Kona inline, which is, uh, well, we'll talk about a little bit later. It's a very interesting vehicle. It is. It is maybe a, a bit sporty. So we'll talk about that. I had the chance to drive the 2022 Kia Sorento X line SX. That essentially has a, a little bit of off road to it uh, and uh, a really interesting vehicle as well. So I'll tell you all about that. If you're looking for an affordable family vehicle, this could be the ticket. That's a little hint to uh, where I'm going to go with the review. We have a terrific interview for you, too. Our special guest is Lawrence Zier. He is General Motors' Ultium Energy Recovery Project Manager. GM has added a new technology to vehicles using its Ultium electric vehicle batteries and that technology, and we'll discuss that with him. Kind of, It sounds like it might be deep in the weeds, but it's really not. It's pretty insightful, leading-edge stuff, so I think you'll want to stick around for that. But before we do that, we'll bring you some of the most important auto-related news from around the world. So stay with us with Chris Teague. This is Jack Nierad with you. And we're so glad you're with us right here on America on the Road. Welcome back, everybody, to America on the Road. This is Jack Nierad with you along with Chris Teague. And we're so glad you're with us. We do appreciate it. It is news time, and I've got a news story. Typically, I think uh, Chris and I, you, uh, we agree on a lot of things. I think we might disagree on this particular news story, but we'll find out. Uh, the news story is this. General Motors, Ford Motor Company, uh, Stellantis, of course, the company that owns Chrysler and Jeep and, and those brands, and Toyota have gotten together to send a letter to Congress asking Congress to lift the cap on the $7,500 electric vehicle tax credit. So that was passed long ago. It's been in place for, I think, the better part of 10 years, maybe longer than that. It's meant to uh, promote zero emission vehicles. And I'm curious as to your take on this uh, request by the car makers. Well, I can see their reasoning behind it. I think they're arguing that uh, consumers are seeing price pressure, how, whatever you want to call it, due to the fact that uh, the prices of the vehicles are going up and the component pricing is going up and it's hard to to make vehicles for the same price point. Uh, I can also see the reasoning behind it from a consumer standpoint. You know, a lot of us want to drive an EV, the 7,500 or 5,000 or whatever it might be. Tax credit uh, is very helpful to get there. Uh, but then on the other side, which I, I know that you, you have some counterpoints to this, I can see a few things. First of all, it artificially changes demand, right? So you're lowering the price or at least you're giving an incentive to do that. Second of all, what happens when these do eventually sunset and people are forced to pay whatever the full price of an EV is then? Uh, what's that going to do? But I still think, on the whole, I believe that these are a good a good step and they need to stay in place. This is where I disagree, Chris. And you've kind of pointed out some of my arguments there. What I have never understood, I continue not to understand, is why the American taxpayer should subsidize well-to-do people buying expensive electric vehicles. I just don't get that. 
Uh, and I think many of us don't get that. And to extend this, and, and potentially it would, again, then revert to some of the, some of the brands, well, it certainly would revert to some of the brands like General Motors that can't now offer them. I think it's, this is kind of like a blatant money grab by these big corporations, by these multinational corporations to reach into the taxpayer's pocket. Because I think what we have seen, and I think you'd find this hard to argue against, the manufacturers have manipulated that tax credit with their pricing. And when that tax credit has gone away, for example, from General Motors, they've lowered their electric vehicle pricing, something that almost never happens, a, a lowering a price. And that just indicates that they've been leveraging the tax credit. I mean, what do you think about that? Yeah, you know, I won't pretend to, to, to uh, believe that this is without its flaws. And I can absolutely see uh, your point of view, you know, why should everyone have to to subsidize the few that, that can afford to drive an EV? I'll say that, you know, I think Maine has done a good job with their uh, tax credit because we are we uh, the efficiency Maine program here uh, gives tax credits for various EVs, but they cap it at a low price. So you can't go buy like a new Tesla Model S or whatever, even if it were eligible for the credits, uh, they wouldn't give you any money for it. It's below, I think, thirty five or forty thousand dollars. So I think that's probably a, a more reasonable limit. But uh, I can see why people are upset about this, especially if you're one of those people, and I know you're not exactly one of those people, but if you're one of those people who wants to hang on to gas cars for as long as possible, this can feel like a, a punch in the gut, especially with everything else costing more. Well, and I also think it, in a way, it could uh, diminish the, the success of electric vehicles over time because it's not giving a true market picture of what uh, of their viability, right? I mean, it's it's throwing $7500 at at their at their cost, which is a big amount of money, and thus the demand isn't what it would really be if the if the vehicles stood on their own. I'm I'm wondering how long these tax credits should be in place. They they've been out there almost a decade or maybe longer than a decade. Uh, it really hasn't moved the needle a whole lot in in getting people to buy electric vehicles. Uh, it certainly didn't for the last decade. Now high gas prices have moved them in that direction a little bit. But uh, I just wonder why the taxpayers should be asked to do this. And, and uh, you know, uh, mainly I'm supportive of car companies, but I, I just think this is a money grab here. Yeah, you know, <laughs> it's hard to it's hard to argue too hard, especially with the points that, that you've you've put out there. Uh, ultimately, arguing that a tax credit is beneficial helps people who buy an EV, right? So that's that's my thinking, right, that we can incentivize people to buy EVs. But at the end of the day, everybody else pays for it, and the automakers benefit more. So uh, I can see both sides of it. Uh, it's not going to be a simple solution, and I, I will have to wait and see what they actually end up doing, if anything at all. Yeah, well, I think they're fearful that uh, Congress is going to change, and it probably will in, in the fall or next year, and uh, their chances of extending this are going to go out the window. But we shall see on that. Well, I, on a more positive note, I, this is an interesting uh, note uh, about electric vehicles. And we're always looking for that battery breakthrough, right, that is going to uh, make batteries cheaper or better or just uh, limit the, the problems one has that are inherent in a battery-powered vehicle. And this might be it, uh, or it might be a complete dud. It's hard to know. But BMW has announced it's testing a long-range battery that's actually been developed by a, a company based in Michigan called Our Next Energy, or One, O-N-E. And that's going to be in the uh, BMW iX electric SUVs coming up. Interesting stuff because it promises a, a vehicle range of maybe 600 miles or more between charges. That's a game changer, isn't it, Chris? Yeah, and they're saying that these batteries use fewer of the, I guess they're called rare earth materials like lithium, nickel, uh, cobalt. So those are great for the environment too. But uh, 600 miles, so that's a that's very impressive. That's better, I believe, than the Lucid Air at its top end, and and it could be a game changer depending on how it's used. I mean, you always have to take these with a grain of salt because these are companies that, among other things, are raising money uh, in the marketplace, and thus maybe they're claiming things that uh, may or may not happen. I think there's. There's some uh, securities laws about that, but uh, I, I'm not suggesting for a second that they're not telling stuff that isn't true. But uh, they're going to be looking at uh, just a, a bunch of different ways of constructing their vehicles to offer this expanded range. And of course, expanded range is critical because if, if you have something like 600 miles of range out of uh, vehicle batteries and they're reasonably priced, that makes an electric vehicle much more viable for a much larger percentage of the population than we're seeing right now. Yeah, and I've 
written m- multiple times about solid state batteries and the steps that, that need to be taken to get to that that particular technology. So if this can be made to to be commercially viable, as you say, and 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 actually put into production, uh, this could be either a great stepping stone or maybe even a, a parallel product to solid state batteries, uh, which can offer you know similar energy density. So uh, I'm really interested in this. I would be interested, although this is you know very early stages, to see what charging looks like for one of these. Yeah, it's interesting to me too that they have two types of battery cells in the battery itself. One has a quote unquote advanced chemistry. Uh, so uh, we'll, we'll see how that unfolds. Of course, a lot of that stuff would be proprietary. So we'll see how that unfolds with BMW. Uh, here's a, somewhat of a related story. Mercedes-Benz uh, expects that EVs will account for half of its sales in the U.S. by 2030. I mean, that's a lot of electric vehicles. I think if you did the math, it's something like uh, be, uh, Mercedes-Benz selling 45,000 electric vehicles in 2023 uh, and then moving that up as they move toward uh, 50%. They sell about 300,000 to 400,000 vehicles uh, in the United States. 350,000 vehicles is their target for next year. So uh, you can figure out what half of that would be. That's a, a one heck of a lot of electric vehicles based on the fact that they haven't sold hardly any electric vehicles up till now. Yeah, I mean, I can see where maybe their optimism is coming from. They've got quite a few models coming to market a lot in the next few months, really. But uh, they've come out and said that they want to move up market. So they're moving away from entry level models like the A-Class here in the United States. So uh, EVs definitely fit within that that sort of shift up scale or up market. And they've got several models that, that fit into different classes. So maybe they can pull it off. I think, you know, production might be a big bottleneck for them uh, making a hundred and some odd thousand EVs a year is going to be tough, especially in the way things are going right now. Well, and it's interesting that Mercedes-Benz is going up market. I think a lot of people would think Mercedes is at the top of the market as it is, or you know, certainly the top of the major market out there. But uh, you're right, they would de-emphasize uh, less expensive vehicles, something that they emphasized over the course and got them a lot of volume, actually, over the course of the last couple of decades. So uh, interesting shift for Mercedes-Benz, and we'll see how that works out for them. And uh, we'll see what this new battery does for BMW. And we'll see what Congress does. So a lot of things pending. And when we come back, what's pending for us are vehicle tests. And we have an all-Korean round of vehicle tests for you. The Hyundai Kona and the Kia Sorento coming up in the next segment. So stay with us for that. With Chris Teague, this is Jack Nerad with you. And we're so glad you're with us. Stay with us. Welcome back to America on the Road with Christy Jack Red with you for road test time. And it is an all-Korean brand round of road tests we have for you. Interesting vehicles. Uh, I was driving the Kia Sorento X-Line. We'll tell you about that in a second. But Chris, you were driving the Hyundai Kona. Let us know all about that. Yeah, the Hyundai Kona is an interesting vehicle overall. Uh, Jack, I think you and I got the chance to drive Uh, the new top-end Kona N when we were together on the Hyundai Santa Cruz launch uh, late last year. Uh, The vehicle I tested looks just like that model. Uh, However, it lacks the super rowdy four-cylinder engine that that vehicle has. So this is the inline. It starts around $27,000. It sits just below the limited trim, which starts right around $30,000 in the Kona lineup. Uh, The Kona is a subcompact sort of crossover. I call it a sort of crossover because when I parked it next to my Uh, Volkswagen Golf GTI. It looked like a little bit of a lifted GTI. So uh, I'm falling somewhere in between warm to hot hatchback and subcompact crossover. Jack, what are your thoughts on the Kona and how it's positioned, especially with the performance uh, models? Well, I think that uh, that Hyundai would like to position it as a crossover because that's what people are buying. But I think you identify the fact that it's as much like a uh, a hatchback as anything else. And I don't think that's a bad thing. And I think those of us who who like driving uh, cars for fun uh, like a a hot hatch. So I think there's a lot to like about uh, what it's bringing to the party, no matter what it's called. Yeah, I do like a good hot hatch. Uh, however, I will say my GTI is a little bit hotter than this car, uh, a little bit more expensive too, but that's uh, that's probably you get what you pay for. So uh, the Hyundai Kona inline, it's got a turbocharged 1.6 liter four-cylinder engine making 195 horsepower, 
195 pound-feet of torque, and it comes with a seven-speed dual-clutch transmission, which is a big upgrade over the standard Kona, which gets a continuously variable transmission and a four-cylinder that makes 147 horsepower. Compare that with the Kona N. That car gets a 286 horsepower four-cylinder engine and is an absolute riot out of the box in every single way possible. Uh, this vehicle is is far short of that in terms of power handling and, and otherwise performance as well. So, uh, you know, 195 horsepower, Jack, I got to tell you, uh, doesn't sound like a lot on paper. It's less than my Golf, but it's decent, especially when you put the vehicle in sport mode, uh, tightens up throttle response, lets it rev out a little bit further. Uh, and it feels lively. I won't call it quick. I won't call it exciting, uh, a little bit more exciting than the base Kona, but uh, all around just, I would say it's a well-rounded package. If you like something that handles reasonably well, that looks aggressive, has enough power to you know, give you a smile every once in a while, this is going to be it. And the price point, I think, fits in with that sort of attitude. It's not on the extreme of performance and nor is it a budget model. So decent power, but it takes a lot to get that power out of the vehicle. Uh, the appearance package here is is absolutely the the highlight of this trim because it is more of a, an appearance trim than it is a performance trim, if you couldn't tell that already. So uh, the vehicle rides on 18-inch 18, 18 inch wheels. It's got a dual exhaust. It's got sport pedals inside. It has Hyundai's in-branded uh, steering wheel and shift knob. Uh, all around, if you didn't know better, you would walk past this and assume that it looks or that it is very fast because it definitely looks aggressive and and, and gives that that vibe. Uh, inside, it's an all-black interior. I wish that it was a little bit more colorful. It's, it's very dark inside, but it is comfortable and spacious. It's black cloth upholstery. Uh, my tester came with an 8-inch display. It's a touchscreen display. However, Hyundai offers a $2,500 upgrade for the car that brings a uh, 10-and-a-quarter-inch touchscreen, uh, moonroof, and adaptive cruise control. Jack, I want to get your thoughts. We talk, I think, we. F I feel like we talk about this almost every week, but uh, Hyundai's infotainment system. What do you think about it? I believe it's it's not very colorful and, and very flashy, but it's one of the better and more intuitive systems on the market. What do you think? I think it is intuitive, and I think that's the best thing about it. Uh, and I think uh, Hyundai and, and Kia, which uses a very similar system, uh, have seen success in things like uh, initial quality surveys from J.D. Power because people understand how to use it. It's not problematic. And I, I think when you're driving a vehicle, uh, the lack of problems is uh, maybe job one. I think it's terrific. Yes, it's pretty seamless. And as we've spoken many times, wireless Apple CarPlay works surprisingly well here. Uh, the smaller screen comes with that. The top, the uh, larger screen requires a wired connection. Uh, one thing I want to say, Jack, in, in closing about this vehicle, and I think it's a big point, it surprised me about a Hyundai, is the it's just a clever design. Some of the things that they've integrated with the way uh, this vehicle works uh, as an example, is it was raining this morning or it was very wet outside this morning when I took the kids to school. Uh, as I was backing out of the driveway, the automatic, the rain sensing front windshield wiper came on. And since I was in reverse, the rear windshield wiper turned on and remained on until I pulled forward again, uh, which kind of worried me that it was broken at first. But once I realized what was happening, it was extremely clever, super helpful. And those are the sorts of things you expect to see out of like Volkswagen or or like another hot hatch uh, brand maker from Europe. So uh, I think Hyundai's done a great job with this. I wish it was a little more powerful, but I think for the right person and the price is, is absolutely a, a great vehicle. Absolutely. I think the, uh, the uh, value is there. It's a bargain at that kind of price. And I like to see that kind of vehicle out there. And if they have to call it a crossover to have it be successful in the marketplace, well, I'm just fine with that. I think that's a good thing. Well, I was driving the uh, 2022 Kia Sorento X-Line SX Prestige all-wheel drive. I think I had to take a breath in, <laughs> as I said all of that. Uh, this is the premier. This is the top of the line Kia Sorento. Uh, for 2022. They changed the uh, Sorento very significantly last year for the 2021 model year. So this is continuing on. Uh, X-Line is important here because this is their bow to the fact that crossovers have an off-road uh, aura about them. I'm not sure whether this is a vehicle you want to take to do any kind of heavy off-roading, but it does have uh, one inch more higher ground clearance it has improved approach and departure angles, which means it can go over bumps better. Uh, that probably will never come into play. The uh, all-wheel drive system is more advanced and, and uh, allows off-roading. It has a snow mode as well. And then it has a robust roof rack. 
<laughs> I like that idea. Uh, the roof rack is actually kind of cool and adds to the, the look of this thing. And before I get any farther, too, I think this Sorento is one good-looking vehicle. In the X-Line, it's particularly good-looking. But certainly, Kia has been scoring with their styling recently, and it, it sure resonates with me. Well, what's your take on uh, the styling of the Sorento, Chris? I agree. I think that the latest redesign of the vehicle gave it the... so. They take a step back. Kia's done a really good job, as you say, of their styling, but they've also taken that the Telluride styling, so their flagship SUV, and they've been able to adapt it to these smaller SUV models in some way or another. Uh, and it works really well with the Sorento. The X-Line package uh, makes it look mean, uh, you know, the 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 lift and the perception that you could do a lot with it. Uh, and I think it looks great, even if it's not as hardcore as it actually advertises itself to be. Right. It also has a nice uh, engine powertrain combination, uh, two and a half liter turbo engine, 281 horsepower, 311 pound feet of torque. That's a lot of torque. Uh, it uses an eight speed wet clutch transmission. And, you know, that's interesting uh, because a lot of times these uh, shift it yourself kind of transmissions uh, are not necessarily uh, smooth, but this was very smooth and operated like a torque converter style uh, transmission as, a, as opposed to a dual clutch. So uh, pretty cool there. As I say, good looking. You can choose either a four by two seating or five plus two seating inside. I guess four plus two is six people. Five plus two would be seven, right? Uh, so the middle row in that vehicle is a bench but a very useful kind of uh, situation. Good looking all the way around. It's offered in five trims. The Sorento f is offered in five trims, including the one we had, the SX Prestige. And then when you throw in the X-Line thing, uh, even cooler, uh, it has torque on demand all wheel drive with a center locking differential. And it has uh, hill descent control as well that adds to the off-roadness of it. Um, and they've changed the bumper and exterior details. It gets 20-inch alloy wheels and this a major roof rack. And, you know, it's just filled with stuff. I mean, I'm, I've got the Mar Monroney in my hand. This is some of the stuff that's standard. It has surround view monitor, blind spot view monitor, 20-inch wheels that I talked about, the uh, roof rails and the, the rack, a 12.3-inch digital instrument cluster. It has... Leather seat trim, perforated leather, ventilated front seats, heated second row seats. I mean, this is all luxury stuff in a vehicle where the MSRP is $45,120, including the destination charge. So I just think there's a, a ton of value here. I, I like the looks of this vehicle. It looks premium. It looks more expensive than it actually is. It acts like a, a little luxury, uh, and even not all that little, because uh, it is a three-row vehicle, a, uh, a luxury crossover. Uh, what's your final take on uh, the Sorento X-Line? I think your 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 assessment of it being a, a luxury, a sub-luxury crossover is great. Uh, Kia's value point, uh, they've done very well with it over the past few years, and, and really for their entire history, but the quality has come along so much. Uh, that it's impossible to ignore now. And then also, if you take their warranty into uh, consideration, it's one of the best values on the market. Absolutely. I, I'm in total agreement with you. I think they've come a long way with this. Uh, styling uh, kind of sets it apart. The fact that you can do some off-roading with it. I wouldn't recommend uh, any kind of heavy-duty off-roading, but I think uh, it has some off-road chops, and it, it certainly looks the part. And uh, I think that's part of the uh, part of the appeal of these vehicles. So I think we've got two vehicles that are certainly worthy of uh, consideration in the Hyundai Kona and the Kia Sorento X-Line. And uh, in an era when <laughs> vehicles are so high priced, right? Uh, the fact that at least they're offering uh, fairly affordable MSRPs and, and that's appealing too. Yeah, anything to uh, get a vehicle without a super markup or for at least a, a decent price is a, is a good thing these days. Well, all days. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely true. And we'll see whether that happens or not. I mean, when I drive by car dealers these days and see how few vehicles they have on their lots, it makes me wonder what kind of deals people are going to get. And, you know, I've been considering buying a, another vehicle for my daughter and uh, maybe putting it off just uh, given what's happening in the market right now. But uh, these are these are value vehicles that we're talking about here. 
And when we come back, our guest will be Lawrence Zier. He is the General Motors Ultium Energy Recovery Project Manager. GM has added this technology to a lot of vehicles using its Ultium electric vehicle batteries and technology, and more on the way. So we'll discuss that with him. Stick around for that, and we'll be right back right here on America on the Road. Welcome back, everybody, to America on the Road. Jack Nierad with you. We have a terrific guest for you. Really interesting topic, too. Lawrence Zier is uh, General Motors Engineering uh, Project Manager on Ultium batteries and and EVs. Certainly, we have been speaking about electric vehicles on the show over and over and over again. Uh, Lawrence, thanks so much for being with us. We appreciate it. Yeah, it's, I'm glad to be here. Thanks. This certainly is a hot topic, right? And I think a lot of people approach electric vehicles and they go, I, I know it's powered by a battery. And maybe they're thinking, I think the, logically they might think that uh, a battery is a battery is a battery. Uh, but that's really not true, is it? There, there's a lot of differences in the uh, construction of the batteries, uh, how they are engineered, Tell us a bit about that before we dive in a, uh, a little deeper. Yeah, and I, I think this is something that we take for granted because you can't see it, right? It's uh, I get in a vehicle, I drive it, it, it moves, um, but you don't see the what is going on in the background. And that's certainly, I think, some of the key characteristics and some of the stuff that, you know, that I work on relative to Altium Energy Recovery is that, you know, we've developed a system that basically tries to protect that, that battery. And the better we protect that battery, the, the, the more efficient, the more range um, is available, um, the more life, right, the, the longer it lasts. Uh, that, those are big deal. I mean, when you start talking about electric vehicles and, and, and really adoption of electric vehicles, really, you know, the more people buy these, you know, it's not, I don't want to learn specifics about my vehicle. I want to be able to get in it and, and drive it, right? I don't, you know, yeah, I don't need to know how the watch is made. I just need to know what time yeah, it is, right? Exactly, exactly. But at the same time, doing these things with the battery are, are important for range. They're important for the longevity of the battery. And it strikes me that the typical uh, automotive battery these days likes temperatures about what human beings like. Uh, am I right there? Absolutely, you are, Jack. I, I, it, we, um, we often, um, you know, in the office, it's like the battery wants to be in the cabin with you. <laughs> so much of our control and, and much of what we do is in and around very similar temperatures that, um, that we're providing the cabin. Um, so you're 100% correct on that. I think you're, you're certainly branding, certainly General Motors is branding its Ulti- Ultium batteries, its Ultium systems as being different from others out there. Uh, tell us how they are different. Yeah, and I, I think what, you know, we're trying to do here is create not just a battery, right? It's, it's, it's a whole vehicle. In the Ultium platform, you have the propulsion side, and certainly the side that I work on in the energy recovery, you know, these are whole systems that are part of the Ultium platform. And why that's important, they all come together to make a very significant product, right? I, I'll say, you know, this is when you bring all of this advanced technology together and package it and then roll it across your entire portfolio, and, and this is what you're going to see with the Ultium uh, system, is that you're going to see it show up in um, you know, our Cadillac Lyric that's coming out. Um, and then you'll see it in other products that we, are, um, you know, we have coming out, basically across the entire fleet. This is huge because it means customer that, uh, has uh, maybe a moderately priced vehicle, will still experience some of the same benefits that our Hummer EV customers are able to experience. And this is something that I think that, you know, this really starts to change the knob because your value is, uh, I'll say, being expanded because you're getting much more car. Um, and we're doing this because GM's big. We're, you know, rolling this out across the board so that, you know, we can take in the economies of scale. Like, we can get the benefits and then give that back to the customer. Let's talk about uh, energy recovery because it's it's important. It's important for efficiency. It improves efficiency. It improves longevity of the batteries too, uh, doing what you do. And uh, let me use this as an, a- an analogy. Uh, the typical conventional car, the heater 
is recovered energy, right? I mean, it's essentially would be otherwise wasted energy. Uh, it can wow. it can be uh, that water, you know, heated by the engine uh, can flow through the cabin and heat the cabin. So that's an, uh, a very simple example, I think, of recovered energy. Uh, you're doing that in in uh, a much more a space age kind of way with Ultium. Uh, tell us about that. Yeah, and that, this is a, a really good point. You know, when you go from your gas-powered ICE vehicle, the energy, um, you know, to an EV, the the waste energy is is significant, right? Like two thirds of the energy that you actually have on your car is wasted; it's gone. And this is why EVs shine so much; is they're very efficient machines. I mean, an electric vehicle is the most efficient way. You know, to move you down the road, you know, when you start looking at a comparison of all the different technologies out there. And it does this because it's, um, you know, it, it does direct conversion of electricity. When you do that, there's not a lot of waste energy that's produced because of that. But what we're trying to do with our system is grab, well, I'll say the very little waste energy that is there um, and certainly store it when we can, meaning I have energy. I don't want to throw it out the vehicle. Um, I can store it and keep it in my uh, in my large battery pack. Or I'm going after you know ambient energy or um, you know uh, humidity, uh, like temperature and humidity. Uh, so there's many different other sources of getting this energy, and we have to do this because we don't have this large source of waste energy like you do on your gas car. Yeah, and what you're really doing is using heat pump technology. Describe that for our listeners, too. I, I, we've all heard that term, I think, but I don't think yeah. many of us really understand exactly what happens there. Yeah, and, and heat pumps have been around forever. This is not, you know, this isn't new technology. The new part of it is the, the combination of our coolant loops with our refrigerant loops and how you do that smartly. Um, and certainly the control of that. That's, that's the, I'll say that's the secret sauce, if you will. Um, you put all these components together um, and you have these multiple systems that you had before now acting as one total system. Um, a heat pump is nothing more than just a, a, a system that actually is moving energy, i.e. pumping heat, right? Your AC system is a heat pump, technically is a heat pump. We don't call it that. We call it an AC system, um, but your AC system is moving energy from one source to another. Typically, what we call a heat pump is running that in reverse, right? Basically, I want to take this uh, this uh, energy and move it up and make it hot and then, you know, send it to the customer, or give it to the customer at a higher quality or a higher temperature, what we call. That's really what a heat pump is doing. It's, it's moving this energy, right, at lower temperatures to a higher temperature. And it does this using compression and uh, latent heat of vaporization and all this technical stuff to, to do that. But the bottom line is, is that this technology isn't the new piece of it. It's really bringing all of these other aspects together and make it an operate as one. Yeah, one thing that I found really interesting, and that is interesting that you've just told us about that, is making that a coherent system, is the fact that it's even capturing ambient heat produced by people within the vehicle, right? I mean, you're finding every source of heat you can get uh, just to make things more efficient. Yeah, absolutely. And, and this, there's no stopping where we're going after energy. And, and this is definitely one mode that you know, it's it's available energy as you breathe or as we, you know, as I'm sitting here, I'm outputting a certain level of energy and it, you get several folks in the vehicle and that energy adds up. So we're able to, you know, pull that energy into our system and remove, extract that humidity, um, that latent heat of uh, that latent energy, and then put that back into heating. And that that is uh, absolutely an energy source. It, it's it's not super huge because the average body is, you know, it's producing like 100 watts um, at rest, um, but it can add up. And every little bit on an electric vehicle makes a difference. If we can get it at any, any place, you're going after it. Yeah, absolutely. And that makes all the sense in the world. Tell us about Watts to Freedom and, uh, you know, pre-cooling the propulsion system. I, I found that fascinating and I'd like to know more about that. Sure. Yeah. So Watts to Freedom, have you experienced it yet or been in one of the Hummer EVs? I have. Super cool vehicle. Super okay. fast as well. Yeah. Right? 
Absolutely. I mean, for, for that size of vehicle, for what it does, it's very, very incredible. It's, it's a lot of fun and a lot of fun to be part of that team. Um, but what we do uh, as uh, our system, so we're taking, um, I'll say, commands or we're understanding when we go in the modes. And then we're going after um, understanding what the propulsion is at and what the battery system is at. And then depending on where they're at, we're going to condition them. If they need to be heated or cooled, we're going after those systems. And we do that to support this, this, this function. So it depends on, like, if it's super hot outside, you know, what we're going to be doing. Or if it's super cold outside, you know, we're, we're reacting to these type of conditions. But the bottom line is, is that we're basically, if you will, we're putting cooling in the bank, right? If I can put a certain level of cooling or a certain level of conditioning, maybe I should say conditioning because it could be heat too. Um, if I put a certain level of conditioning in the bank, then I can push those components harder and have enough to protect them, right? And this is really what it's all about. Our system is there to enable these cool features and we enable it by protecting them. If we can keep them cool, we can keep them hot these things can do much more than what they're asked to do. And by doing so, you get features like lots of freedom, which is super cool because that truck is, it's, it's just massive. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it is certainly an off-road uh, beast. Um, and uh, that's one of the many modes that we support. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's product. almost like a building that will go from zero to 60 in three seconds. So uh, it's pretty amazing. <laughs> exactly, yeah, yeah. Get in your house, it accelerates. <laughs> right, right. Tell us why. We alluded to the fact that batteries like to live in a particular temperature that's kind of like humans like to live in. But why is that? Like uh, charging a battery in, in really cold weather can be a problem. Describe that to us uh, you know, kind of in layman's yeah, terms, if it, you will. It, I'll, I'll bring it to a high level, and it's really simple. It, battery technologies it does not like the, the, uh, the chemistry doesn't allow for the electrons to move, right, as quickly. And you can have certain things like plating that goes on at low temperatures. And what that does is it produces resistance that prevents us from getting energy and moving energy in and out of the pack. Um, so when you have a battery that's cold, for instance, it could be fully stored up. It could, you could have all of, I just charged it, it's fully charged but you can't get all of that energy out of it because uh, the chemistry is, is operating at a much slower. So it's kind of like, you know, you're kind of cold, right? And you don't move as quickly. It's the same similar type deal. And bringing that temperature up in the battery unlocks that capacity, right? So if you will, it's a gas tank as a function of temperature, but the real advantage is keeping that battery at an optimal temperature and the reason for it is if you're going to do regen for instance it you, you can't put as much regen into the battery if it's cold yeah um it has limits on how much current and that's voltage related right so this isn't specific to gm this is really the battery technology is that you know when we're accelerating a car and we're decelerating a car that current that that's moving in and out of the pack is greatly reduced because of the, the temperature of the battery. Got it. Well, where can people who are about to buy vehicles find this kind of technology? Because I, I think it, some vehicles that are about to go on sale or are already on sale have this Ultium Energy Recovery stuff. Uh, tell us about that. We have several vehicles that we have already out and they all have uh, the Ultium. So the Hummer, cargo van, um, and then now I think we have the, the Lyric coming out yeah, the Cadillac Lyric electric SUV. Exciting car. I mean, that that's a great product. Um, super fun to drive and, and super cool looking. And all the vehicles coming out that are branded Ultium. So if it's an Ultium system, it has our it has our system in it. Sounds terrific, Lawrence. Uh, thanks so much for being with us. We really do appreciate it. Thank you, Jack. I appreciate it. Thank you for bringing me on. And stay with us, everybody. We'll be right back right here on America on the Road. Welcome back to America on the Road with Chris Jack. We are back with you, and it is listener question time. We love taking your listener questions. We love taking your questions, and if you're listening, I guess the a question from you becomes a listener question. 
Well, we're here to help, so send us those listener questions. And Chris, I have a question for you. I think uh, you're the perfect guy to answer this. Wally in Cocoa Beach, Florida says this. I'm looking for a sports car that I can have some fun with, and I don't want to spend more than forty or $50,000. Do you have some suggestions for me? I do have a few suggestions for you, Wally. Uh, so I think that, the, first of all, you should look at the Toyota GR86 and the Subaru BRZ. They were redesigned for this model year. They have more power. Uh, they're available with a, a manual transmission, and even the automatic transmission in those is not awful if you like that. Uh, there's always the Ford Mustang. You can get that with a manual as well. I think you could probably get uh, a nice four-cylinder model, maybe a GT for that much money. I'm not quite sure about that. Uh, you could also go the hatchback route. You heard me talking about my Volkswagen Golf GTI earlier. Uh, so that's under $40,000. Uh, Jack, I think there's a surprising number of cars, the Honda Civic Si. So there are some great choices out there for this budget. There really are. And in this era of crossovers, buying a car and uh, buying a coupe or a sports car, uh, maybe there's been no better time because there's a great crop out there. And Many times they're being left uh, on dealer lots when the crossovers are going out the door. One you didn't mention is, of course, one that's very dear to my heart, and that's the Mazda Miata that continues to put smiles on faces now um, decades after it was introduced. And uh, I think it's it, that's kind of the di dictionary definition of a sports car or a sports car as, as I grew up with them. Uh, so that's another one I would add to the list that could be had for about forty or 50000 bucks. Yeah, and let's not forget the Nissan Z is coming back soon, too. That'll probably be around that price as well. Absolutely. Good good call out on that as well. And uh, it's always great to talk with you about cars. Chris, thanks so much for being with us again this week. I've enjoyed it a lot, and thanks, everybody, for listening. If you like what you heard and you want to take us with you wherever you go, you can head to sportsmapradio.com and find us on the Saturday schedule. There you can find our Apple podcast as well as a podcast from other outlets. Uh, and a formatted radio show recording uh, there as well. I love that because it has the opening with the Raspberries, one of my favorite bands from years past. And uh, thanks to the Sports Map Radio Network stations for carrying America on the road. We do appreciate that. And thanks most of all to you for listening to America on the Road. You're the reason we do what we do. So thanks for being out there. And we look forward to talking to you again next week on another edition of America on the Road. America on the Road is brought to you by Mercury Insurance and DrivingToday.com. If you're looking to save some money, you should switch to Mercury for your auto and home insurance. Californians save an average of $670 with Mercury, so imagine how much you could save. Get a quote today at DrivingToday.com slash auto insurance. That's DrivingToday.com slash auto hyphen insurance. And if you're looking to buy a new car or used car, just care about cars, go to DrivingToday.com. DrivingToday.com is the official automotive website of America on the Road.